Our lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 4. And this, of course, is a famous story of Jesus in the temptation of the wilderness. But Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted for 40 days and nights, and afterwards he was famished. And so the tempter said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here ends the lesson. And so today, we're actually going to take a look at the Bible, at the Word of God. And so I've got my nifty nifty Bible sitting right back here. It's my, probably my favorite one in terms of it's one I take with me to all my visits and so forth. But it is still the same Bible that hopefully you have and read at home. And this is an important book. Last week we talked a little bit about prayer and how important that was as a connection to your relationship with God. But this is also important if you want to deepen your relationship with God for this to be one of the first and foremost things that you do every single day. That you take a little bit of time and read this. But when we look at this, and we can start with our sermon handout for today, <clears throat> when we look at what is the Bible, what is this book? Because, you know, there have been a lot of Bibles written all over the world. Bibles on the, the, the computer Bible or the guitar Bible or this or that. They basically show you and demonstrate to you how you're supposed to use those devices. But this one is a little bit different because this just isn't a how-to book. In fact, it really, if, you, if your goal is to find a how-to to how to do everything in life and how to live your life successfully, you, you may be a little bit disappointed with this book because that's not its sole and entire purpose. And in fact, it doesn't have everything for every single circumstance. It really is a book about God's love. It's called the Word of God, so it is transformative for your life. We're talking a little bit more about how you are to use this in a moment, but what is it? The Word of God, we said. So it is the Word of God. And if you remember in the Old Testament, why this word, W-R-D, is so important is because in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, when God decided that God was going to create the universe, God did not pull out a director set and pull out his wrenches. God spoke a word, let there be light, and light happened. And we are told the same thing is true in the New Testament book of John, when God wanted to speak a word of love and forgiveness, he spoke a word of love and forgiveness, and Jesus was born. So you see, Jesus himself is not just a messenger of God, not just a nice message or a, a, a messenger of God's love. He is God's love. You know, I, I think we would take that a little bit more uh, seriously in our communication with each other that our words are a part of ourselves. So oftentimes, hmm, I'm sorry, somebody will say something really rude or nasty, and I say, well, I'm sorry, just a few words. No, those words can be very hurtful, can't they? Words can pick up, they can lift up, they can destroy. Words are a part of us. The words that come out of our mouth, and the same thing is true with God. When God speaks a word, God takes responsibility for them, owns them, and they are powerful to transform lives. Transform lives. And so when we look at the third thing under what is the Bible, the Bible is one of the ways in which God tells us about himself and his love for us. So this is where I'm going to get a little bit geeky, and I hope I don't lose you all with this, but I get really excited when I talk about the Bible itself because I'm looking at it certainly as the Word of God, and that's what is the most important thing about it, but it is also a book, and it really gets me excited as a book because it represents a large snapshot of humanity and what was going on at those times and places. So it's also a book in time as well as a book, uh, as well as a book of God's Word. And so, who wrote the Bible? Well, it's 100% the work of humans. 100%. This book was not just handed down to us in the form that it was written in. In fact, this book took about three to 4,000 years to write. That's amazing. And it is time-tested. It's one of those books that over and over and over again, uh, people of faith would read it and say, well, you know what? This should be passed on. We should pass this on generation to generation. But the authors who wrote the book did not sit there and think, I'm writing a Bible that I'm going to pass on for generations. That wasn't their thought process. They're writing a book to help people out who are local people, people who are family members, and so they wrote these books, and then we just esteem them and pass them on the book form that it's today. But believe me, when I tell you it's 100% the work of human beings, but it is also 100% God-inspired. Now, what it means to be God-inspired, it means to be God-breathed. 
is the meaning of both the divine and the human in one book. And that's what makes this book so spectacular. And so any of you who have ever taken the time to actually pick up the Bible and read it, you know that there's a lot of interesting stories in here. Not all of them, hi there Mia, not all of them are books that you want to necessarily uh, put up there in their top ten of your top reading. In fact, most people say when they first look at the Bible, say, well, I'm going to read the Bible from front cover to back cover, book of Genesis to book of Revelation. And I'm going to tell you, that's a really bad idea. You want to know why it's a bad idea? Because you're going to get through Genesis, you're going to get through Exodus, and you're going to get to Leviticus, and you're going to say, this really stinks. And you're going to get bogged down in the book of Leviticus. It's going to be a pain in the butt. Because after all, some of the books of the Bible are really difficult to understand and are really honestly annoying. I'm telling you, you get into the book of Leviticus, you're going to be bored to tears. Same thing with Numbers and Deuteronomy. You're going to say, oh my gosh, I just wish I could get through this stuff. And a lot of people pick up the Bible and start reading it and they never get through to those books or after those books. That's the end of their reading. So you have to understand, some passages in the Bible are hard to understand. Some passages are very human. The very human nature of the purple people who wrote them shines through. Good example, Paul's books. There are some people who just cannot stand St. Paul. They don't like his books. In fact, about 12, 15 years ago, I did a sermon series on the book of uh, Romans. And I'm telling you, it probably took us like 40 weeks to get through the whole book of Romans. I had one woman who came up to me and says, I'm just getting so sick and tired of this because I can't stand Paul. He's a misogynist. He's a bigot. He's a twit. I can't take it anymore. Are you, how, long are you, how much longer are you going to do this guy in, in, uh, in church? And I'm just like, well, it's an important book. Well, I can't stand him. We well, you know if you read Paul's books, the one thing you do figure out really quickly is, yeah, sometimes he is a bigot. Yeah, sometimes he is a twit. Yeah, sometimes he's hard to deal with, and sometimes he's an arrogant son of a gun. And he's tough to deal with sometimes. I'm not sure I would really like to meet St. Paul. In the top ten list of people I'd like to meet, Paul isn't one of them. He's an annoyance. But yet, a lot of the New Testament is written at the hand of Paul. What do you make of that? What I make of that is that despite his arrogance, despite being a twit, despite, despite the fact that you might feel him to be a misogynist, God spoke through him. That's what I find so incredible. It's both the human and the divine, and God's word is always made known, despite the human nature of it. Or another example, if you take a look at Samson in the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, that was a hero of the Bible. We held Samson up as a great hero of faith. But you know, Samson is not exactly the type of person that I want to hold up to my kids or my grandkids or my great-grandkids as an example of faithfulness. This man was, quite frankly, an idiot. And he was nasty. And he was a horrible person. But I think what the Bible tells us by holding up people like this is that God uses even the worst of people to do his work. That's what I find so inspiring about the Bible, is that it doesn't lift up this rose-colored uh, viewpoint of all the characters and people of faith. It actually presents them as they are. So again, some passages, the human of the Bible shines through, yet God still speaks through them. And there are some, here's the thing about this book too. There can be mistakes in the translation. I'm holding up to you right now the New Revised Standard Version. Some of you might use the New the NIV. Some might use the New Living Translation. And if you actually open up those books and you start comparing them one, one copy to the next, you're going to find not just disagreements in how it's translated, but sometimes you're going to find complete discrepancies in how it's translated. Because again, it came from, in the New Testament, from Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew originally. And so how in the world do you translate that? So sometimes our translations have mistakes in translations. A uh, good example, book of Ephesians, chapter 5, in the NIV, I'm outright telling you, don't read it. It's a horrible translation. In fact, I'm outright telling you it's a wrong translation because they uh, politicize the book of Ephesians in chapter 5. So that can happen in our translations. 
The other thing that happens in our, uh, oftentimes is there are mistaken interpretations. I can be wrong. Pastor down the street can disagree with me about how we're supposed to interpret and understand the Bible. There can also be mistakes and transmission. Now, I mentioned to you this book was three or four thousand years in the making, right? It didn't just come to us in this form. And in the New Testament books, let me use a good example, the book of Ephesians. I've been referring to that. You may not be aware that there's about 850 to 900 copies in Greek of the book of Ephesians. And there are many discrepancies between those Greek copies of Paul's book. So what do you do? You try the best you can as scholars to compile that book and try to figure out what did he originally write because we only have copies of copies of copies many times over of the original book of Paul. So oftentimes there are mistakes and errors that take place because of the copies that, for which we're translating in the Bible. And yet the amazing thing about that, despite all of these mistakes and all these things that can creep in, it is still God's word. And the message itself is without error. It doesn't mean that the messengers certainly are not. It doesn't mean sometimes the book doesn't have mistakes in it. But God always communicates to us his message of love through this book. All right, I, I geeked out a little bit with that, but let's go on to the next one. So the Bible for us is the authority of the Christian life, and therefore it's never outmoded. And we cannot change the Bible to accommodate our culture. We should always change our culture to accommodate what the Bible wants to teach us. But the most important thing is not our traditions, but the fact that this book tells us about the love of God for us. So if you're, you know, I, I, I caution you when you pick this up, I told you that this isn't basically a, a blueprint. There are some churches where they preach that the Bible is a blueprint for your life or what you're supposed to do. I don't believe that to be true. I don't think you should open this up and say, oh, I'm going to find something for every occasion or every decision of my life. Oh, I think I should find all the laws that God wants to teach me. If you're living in that manner, you're not living by God's grace through Jesus Christ. This book is not about listing a whole bunch of rules and laws and regulations by which you're supposed to live. This book is supposed to teach you how to love. And that's what the stories are about. The story of God's love for humanity, and that's what's supposed to transform your life in the reading of this book. Not the laws of this book, but the love of God that comes to us through the stories of this book. So this book... This Bible will show us how we can gain access to a loving relationship through Jesus Christ with God. It also brings us to faith. It has the power to transform our life when we read it. And it ultimately speaks words of peace, joy, guidance, and healing to our lives. And it's a protection against spiritual attacks. It's an amazing book. This is what God can do through this. And so here's how you use this book. What I would hope that you would do, just the same thing that you do with your prayer life, you take a few minutes every single day to open up the Bible and at least read a passage. Now, there's some people, again, who, who have a very ambitious plan when they ultimately come to a relationship with Christ and say, I'm just going to read it cover to cover. I'm going to start reading the book of Genesis, and I'm telling you, don't do that. Your best bet is to read just a small passage here or there of the Scripture until you develop a discipline of reading the Scripture. Because if you're too ambitious, if you say, oh, I'm going to start reading like uh, the whole Bible in a year, you're going to peter out pretty quickly. It's better to read one or two verses a day and let that Bible reading grow in your life rather than trying to be too ambitious. So find some quiet time in a quiet place where you can read the Bible every day. Be consistent with it. Develop a reading plan. Read from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And don't be overly ambitious. It's better to start with five minutes, begin with prayer life in your day, and remember this, whenever you read the scripture, you ought to ask these following questions. Who wrote the passage that I'm reading today? To whom was it written? What was the context of the passage of scripture? And then in, as a consequence, what does it mean for me? Because you have to understand, this book was written for me, but it was not written to me. When the authors wrote this book, they had something completely different in mind. They had a totally different context in mind. And so we have to 
probably pick up like a, a uh, it's probably a good idea for you to go to like the Christian bookstore online and, and pick up something that will give you an idea of what the context of the scripture is. Because otherwise it's very easy to misunderstand what God is trying to speak to you if you actually start believing that St. Paul sat there 2,000 years ago and wrote this book for Dave Jones. He didn't. He wrote his books for a particular place, a particular context, and I need to know what that context is before I can understand what it means and what God is trying to speak to me. So what's going to happen when you read the scriptures? What will happen is, is that you will produce fruit and you will have strength to persevere in your life. God will prosper you, not necessarily physically or materially, but in your relationship with God, God will transform your life so that you're no longer dry and withering spiritually, but will nourish you so that your relationship with God continues to grow. So let me just throw out like one last piece of advice before we uh, conclude with our prayer for today about the Holy Scriptures when you think about the Scriptures. I had somebody one time who said to me, this is like 20 years ago, who said, uh, you know what, Pastor, I read the Bible every day. I said, well, good for you. He said, yeah, I took a highlighter, a yellow highlighter, and I highlighted all the dirty parts, and I read that every single day. I'm like, okay, I don't know if you say that just to shock me. <clears throat> and knowing the guy, it was probably somewhat true, but I said, hey, even if you're just reading, and trust me, there are actually some very risque and dirty parts in the Bible. If that's all you're reading, good for you. At least you're opening up the scriptures, right? And God will transform your life for us. But I do want to give you this. The Bible is, in, is written to us and given to us in 66 different books for a reason. Because out of those 66 different books, maybe 20 or 30 of them are going to be powerful and meaningful to you. And maybe some of the other 30, 35 you're going to look at and say, this one doesn't work with me at all. And that's how good God is. Is God gave us a large variety of in the Bible so that something will touch your life. So you may not be aware of this, Martin Luther actually despised one of the books of the Bible. He hated it so badly, he wanted it out of the Bible. Anybody know what book that was? The book of James. Now I say that, and there are a lot of you listening, and some of you here are saying, that's my favorite book in the Bible. Well, there you go. That proves my point. So Martin Luther should never read the book of James, but if James speaks to you, maybe it's because that's what you need to hear. So I'm giving you permission to do something that maybe you never thought you would hear from a pastor. Book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, if they don't speak to you, don't ever bother reading them. Who cares? I don't care. Read the books that God can use to transform your life. Because it is a powerful book. You just need to open it up and read. And God will touch you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can touch and transform our lives through the reading of the Holy Scripture. And I know that not all the Bible is going to work for everybody. It doesn't mean that it's not the Word of God for everybody. It doesn't mean that all the Bible isn't the Word of God. It all is the Word of God. But you provided it for us in the format so that every single one of us can hear something that we need to be blessed. And so I'm asking that people would open up that book, crack that Bible, because there is some powerful stuff in there, and you want to speak to us and change our lives. And we are so grateful, and we give you thanks, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I'm going to offer